Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. I think we'll do something a little bit different today. I, I have to warn you that this is not going to be a safe space. There may be triggering things that you will hear. And I mention this because there are a lot of folks out there who seem to believe that they are entitled to never hear anything they disagree with so that I will get, uh, you know, reaction. People go, well, Charlie, you uh, you lost me yesterday because you expressed this opinion and I am never going to be listening to you again. <laughs> or how, why did you allow that guest to, um, you know, pr present that particular view? Well, because people, this is what we do here. You know, if you really don't want to hear an opinion that you disagree with, maybe you should just, I don't know, just talk to yourself. You know, go in a room, create your own echo chamber, and then you will never confront an idea that you don't uh, that you don't agree with. And this is something that, you know, frankly, I have been talking about for a long time. I just think it's a very strange thing. Um, actually, back in the, the 80s and the 90s, I remember thinking how strange it was that people in, on university campuses would become indignant that they had heard something that offended them. And, and, and my reaction at the time was, you know, if you really you know, never want to be offended, you should join like a Trappist monastery or something <laughs> or live in the woods. Just don't ever go on public transit and don't go to a university where the whole point is that you're going to be presented with ideas that are going to make you uncomfortable. They will make you uncomfortable because in theory, you went to the university to learn something because you were stupid. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. That, that, that you, you had a certain level of ignorance that needed to be challenged. And anytime you challenge ignorance, it's going to be uncomfortable in any case. Uh, our guest this weekend is Greg Lukianoff, who is the president and CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE, the co-author, what a great title this book is, The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. Greg, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for, so much for having me, Charlie. Well, um, people, just a little bit about backstory here. Uh, that one of the reasons I wanted you on the on the uh, on the podcast is you are trolling me on uh, on, on, so, on social media. Po you, positive you, you, trolling. You pulled my chain. You actually, well, what was, I don't I don't want to misquote you here, but 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 you basically called me out and said, you know, Charlie, why aren't you talking more about the attacks on free speech on universities? You used to talk about this all the time. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you poked me, and and you know, and I felt it. I mean, the left that's, not, that's not really what I said, Charlie. I said, "Why aren't okay. you bragging about having been right about this um, it, it, in the uh, in, in the late '80s, early '90s?" <laughs> well, this it, is it wasn't true. negative. It was actually saying, "Dude, like I, I reread your stuff, and I was like, you were saying this before almost anybody else." Well, yes, I, I, I was, and it does feel like a different a different world. And you know, and that's why I, I, I do appreciate this. This this is true. That um, I actually remember having lunch with uh, some reporter it must have been after one of my first books came out mm -hmm. and it was for a for a major national magazine and i said you know one of the things that bothers me the most are the number of universities that are actually creating speech codes uh, mm -hmm. no formal bans on speech and he gave me this look like no <laughs> I said, how many and it was like no this is really happening and so at, at that point this had not really penetrated that that the universities were going so far as to, you know, write down rules of what you could say and what you couldn't say. And I mean, you know, I, n now that seems like old news, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it, it's it's kind of funny because the there was a sort of a crop of article uh, of books talking about the problem in higher ed starting around the mid 80s, you know, Alan Bloom's um, uh, uh, Closing of the American Mind. Um, your book, Prof Scam, and then Hollow Men, um, of course, you know, also by people like Dinesh D'Souza and Roger Kimball. Yeah. But um, uh, but it was, you know, largely conservative saying that there's a problem on campus. Um, the funny thing is now uh, most of the people who are critics of higher ed, or at least the best known ones, with, with a few exceptions, are more either moderate or liberal. I, I'm actually a Democrat. Um, and what's funny is, like, people keep on trying to push even that group into the uh, realm of the unacceptable right winger. And it's like, no, no, the conservatives made this argument in like the eighties and nineties. And you also dismissed it then. And incidentally, Charlie, all of this happened right before everything was about to get much worse. Mm 
Um, when the last right. speech code was defeated uh, at my alma mater, uh, Stanford Law School, in 1995, which, by the way, I got there in 97, and nobody breathed a word of this when I was there, yeah. it was like a dirty little secret. Um, uh, the viewpoint diversity on campus plummeted in the late 90s. Um, the number of speech codes skyrocketed. This is actually something that most people don't know, um, is that by the time we actually were able to really start evaluating it, we found, um, it, with kind of rigorous data, we found in 2008 something like 75 or 79 percent of colleges had speech codes, despite the fact they had been defeated in court from 1989 to 19, 1995. The, and I, I want to get to why that is, because it, and, and it can, the more, the, you know, for the last 20 or 30 years, I, it just blows my mind that institutions that are founded on the, on the whole concept of, of teaching critical thinking uh, and academic freedom would would adopt these speech codes. But let's talk about how big the problem is. Mm -hmm. Because there is this back and forth with people saying that the university, you know, has just lost its way. You saw this with some of the, um, uh, uh, you know, folks that went to found the university of the new university of Austin. <laughs> yeah. uh, sort of this apocalyptic view that the university has just ceased to be a place where any ideas can be spread around. And then on the other side, there are people who say there's no problem whatsoever. There's right. none. There's, there's just a few scattered anecdotes and no big deal. So right. obviously, this is what you do for a living is to document exactly how widespread this is. So how big a problem is this and where does it come from? Well, uh, those are two very big questions. Um, and to be clear, we've only mo moved more towards, so I'm the president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. I've been doing this since 2001, so I just celebrated my 20 years um, doing this. And we've only recently really focused on documenting. We've only been big enough to start doing um, more, more research uh, into our own data more recently. Um, because our main job was actually to battle it, was, was to make sure that we defended the rights of student and faculty. And by the way, all over the spectrum, like the, the, there's a big middle of unsexy cases that never make it into the, uh, in, into the media that aren't all that political, that they are, you know, um, internal fights between administrators and students or administrators and professors, sometimes about things as, um, you know, unsexy as whether or not you have a student union, um, and those get very little coverage. Um, and I, and, uh, and so one of the things we've been trying to do is, is to try to, you know, document this a little bit better. And the reason why, you know, I'm, I'm currently somewhat at wit's end is that we did a, we started trying to research how, how common it is for professors to get targeted for being fired on campus. Um, and we published something where we showed that in 2020 alone, and 2020 was a particularly bad year. It was actually the worst year that, I, that I'd ever seen for free speech on campus. And that's hmm. saying a lot, given it's really season. okay. Uh, there were something more over 120 professors targeted for being uh, fired. And we actually had the son, the son of Martin Gurry, um, I, I forget his first name, um, wrote, wrote something uh, that, that got quoted by Michelle Goldberg, someone I really like uh, mm -hmm. at the New York Times, by the way, Michelle Goldberg, mm -hmm. um, saying that, wow, if a problem was happening at this level of frequency, we'd consider it essentially solved. And, and mm. I felt, felt this compulsion to sort of start putting these numbers in perspective. This means that there were 20 incidents like that um, it, at Stanford uh, since 2015. There were 12 at Harvard uh, since 2015. Again, you, there were eight at Penn. Um, it, at, it, there was seven at Yale. And then, of course, you have this very big Yale case now. But the funny thing about that, Charlie, is that the, the case that's currently being treated like it was a really bad case at Yale, because it was a really bad case, uh, just so listeners know, this was at the law school, and you expect law schools to be a little bit more mature about some of this stuff. But a student had written in a, a joke email, and this is, this is a, a, a gay Native American student, um, to, uh, to one of the multicultural groups to, uh, about having a party and it, it was talking about, you know, come to the trap house, you know, in order to, mm -hmm. and full, full disclosure, I used to have that job in law school, which is <laughs> you know, you get people together for, uh, for drinks. And your whole role is to, is to write a jokey email. Like, it, and, and the goal is to be as funny as possible. And maybe this wasn't all that funny, but he, ref he used the term trap house. Trap house is slang for a place that sells drugs. Oh my goodness. But that got interpreted as him being racially insensitive because even though this is slang that's pretty common among younger people, it's also used by African Americans. And they really tried, they really threw the book at him. And what's remarkable about this case is it's getting really good um, reporting uh, from the uh, Alan's, uh, I forget how his last name, Aaron Silburn at the um, 
uh, at the at Washington Free Beacon. But for us at FIRE, this is just another day at the office. We've seen tons of cases like this. And, and one, one more example that's also been um, you know, Dorian Abbott. Uh, was a professor. Uh, yeah, no, this is this is one of the most prominent cases. Yeah, yeah. and he's a scientist. Um, he's an astrophysicist, I think, um, and he's at Chicago. But he wrote a letter. Um, he he wrote an op-ed saying that we. I think the current focus of diversity, equity, and inclusion is misplaced, and I think that um, that we should pick people according to merit. And it, and it's not some crazy screed. It's actually a pretty reasonable um, critique. Some of which I agree with, some of which I don't. But yeah. so what? Um, and he got disinvited. From MIT, um, because of this outside writing, it had nothing to do with what he was going to be speaking on. Now that's bad, of course, and people expect better of MIT. But if you look at Caltech, MIT, um, Virginia Tech, we've seen more than a dozen examples of professors being disinvited for things unrelated to what they were going to say at technical schools. So I think like people, the fact that pe- people, when they find out about some of these things, are horrified. It's like, where have you been? <laughs> Yeah, where have we been over the last 20 years? So the Dorian Abbott case is 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 very interesting because we're not talking about somebody who made a slur or said something on social media or anything like that. He wrote an article expressing an opinion about what the standards of, of scientific academia should be, right? He was going to give a speech that had nothing to do with that subject, it was not a political talk that he was going to give really, MIT. Yeah, really cool yeah. astrophysics thing. I wish I could remember. Right. Exactly Astro- it was, he was going to talk on astrophysics, and yet someone objected because he had expressed this opinion. So, okay, the, the obvious question I have to ask you is, w- why is this happening now? Where does it come from? Is this Is this all a function of, and I feel like the word's already you know, worn out, wokeness on campus mm-hmm. yeah i mean is 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 this why we're seeing this surge because of the of of woke of woke academics or woke students um as per usual you know my explanation of this it you know has multi steps just like we did in coddling the american yeah. mind my, my my book with jonathan height trying to figure out why the students hitting campus in 2014 were so different um than the students than millennials for example mm-hmm. Um, you know, we talk about six different causal threads. You know, um, we, we talk about the feedback loop of polarization, which we call the polarization spiral, that the right and left tend to make each other even worse in reaction to the, you know, perceived or sometimes accurate sins of the other side. So it, it's one of these, when people talk about it's the right Crucial. side, it's the left side, it's kind of like, well, they actually, re- <laughs> they, they drive each other nuts and it makes everything more intense. Um, but I do think that a lot of what you were seeing early on um, the fact that there was relatively low viewpoint diversity on, uh, among professors, even in the even in the eighties, it was it was still about t- two to one, three to one, um, uh, a li- a liberal to conservative uh, back then, um, and that's gotten way worse. You know, it's now I think five to one, but th- and that hides the fact that it's literally zero people in s- some of these academic departments uh, w- would self describe as conservative or certainly you know. Um, Vote, certainly not vote conservative. And that's a problem because it creates groupthink, it creates tribalism, it creates all these other distortions. Um, one of the big trends that has made everything worse um, is the hyper-bureaucratization of universities. Um, and the uh, and and that's actually even more, as, as Samuel Abrams, um, a, gr- a great statistician that I get to work with sometimes, um, has pointed out that that's a group that's even more ideologically um, monolithic, but also has a much more daily um, interaction with students. That, that, that is, um, you know, they run the bias-related incident programs, which are kind of the successors to the speech codes. Where Is, it, is this just the, when you're talking about the bureaucracy, you're talking about the, the diversity bureaucracy, the diversity, inclusion, equity bureaucracy, or the whole bureaucracy? I'm talking about the whole bureaucracy. Okay. Uh, I'm talking Talking about the whole bureaucracy, I actually we've had the most issues with people in residence life, actually, um, because the residence life um, you know, uh, officials, you know, think that it really is literally their job to sort of uh, police a speech pr- pretty often. Now, of course, to be clear, there's always people who are, who are very good at this. Actually, I'm, I'm sure that most people are, are are trying to trying to do the best, but that's also um, there are also plenty of examples of both RAs getting in trouble for being slightly dis- non-conforming, but also you know ratting on students to get to get them on, them in trouble. And and you mentioned the fact, Charlie, that you know um, when you talked about Dorian Abbott, that this wasn't a slur. Yes, absolutely. I'm a First Amendment lawyer. I worked at the ACLU of Northern California. Like this is this is my lifelong passion. 
Um, and I'm willing to defend even the Nazis. In fact, we did a documentary about the life and times of Ira Glasser. I'm the exec- one of the executive mm-hmm. producers, um, uh, uh, the old executive director of the ACLU, um, who defended the Nazis at Skokie. Um, so I'm willing to defend the most extreme speech. But overwhelmingly, what I deal with on campus are oftentimes nice kids, pretty uh, nice professors who are saying things that they have no idea how this could possibly be interpreted in an offensive way. Give me an example of that. Um, well, I mean, like the, the, the most classic example that I talk about, you know, going, going way back was the uh, case where a student was reading um, uh, Notre Dame versus the Klan. Um, it's a book celebrating. Oh, the gosh, I remember Klan. that story. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's that's one of my that's one of my classic cases. And he was found guilty of racial harassment. Now that that was a long time ago. But I also think of think of the trap house case as being you know kids just being you know tr- trying to crack a joke. Um, one of the things that, that that's been interesting and uh, and above the law has definitely been pushing this really hard is that it used to be considered um, scholarly. Uh, and, and, and acceptable to, uh, if you're talking about a case, uh, a Supreme Court case that involves racial epithets, remember that this. as long as you're not using that term against the student, which would, you know, would be fireable um, uh, it, it, in a lot of cases, the, um, uh, but if you're discussing it in an academic way, you're supposed to kind of shift the way you think about it and be able to talk about these things, particularly as they're accurately reported from, from Supreme Court cases. And we've seen dozens of examples of, of professors, mostly from the left, um, getting in trouble for not using a slur, but but, meant, but but actually uttering the entire word, which is a major norm shift um, just in the last five years, including, you know, uh, like I said, a, a liberal professor at um, at the New School who was who was making the point that the book uh, "Not My Negro," um, which was about um, James Baldwin that it showed a lot of temerity for misquoting James Baldwin because that's not the word James Baldwin actually used. Mm-hmm. And, and we see, you know, we, uh, we got 1500 case submissions in 2020. So like it can be hard to even get through all the examples we've seen. And it's important for listeners to understand about 400 schools educate about 50% of the students in the country. This idea that there are very few, like th- th- there's people who would like hmm. uh, people to be- uh, like listeners to believe that there are like a hundred thousand schools and many millions hmm. of professors when it's actually much more concentrated um, uh, uh, th- than people think. So here's a, here's, a, here's a question that I have for you that I, I know that you dealt with in the coddling of the American mind. When I first started writing about this, one of the one of my initial takeaways was that there were people who were locked and loaded looking for things to be offended about, that a lot of the cases involved uh, speech that actually didn't offend anyone, but that yeah. someone wanted to be offended or they would use it as a cudgel because there were certain advantages to claiming victim status or being offended. But now I wonder whether or not it shifted from people thinking that they ought to be offended to actually to real snowflakes who really are offended by this, that this new generation actually, when they do hear a view that they've never heard before, which is, of course, you've described you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the polarization that we live in, it's possible that suddenly you hear an, an, uh, you know, an, an idea that you know, just seems you know, completely radical to you. So, I mean, have people become more hypersensitive? Oh, or, yeah. Or, or is it still kind of a cynical, uh, I'm, I'm posturing and I'm going to make a case of something. I'm not really offended, but I think somebody might be offended. So there, there might be somebody out there, sort of the mythical person who is offended by every single word or thought or image that they don't like. The true answer, as it is to most things, is all these things are happening at the same time. Um, we see cases where they very much look cynical, where someone is just trying to get that student or professor they don't like fired. Um, but I do think that, uh, and one of the things we talk about in Coddling the American Mind is the incredible disservice we do to these, you know, oftentimes absolutely brilliant young students, you know, uh, and starting in K through 12, telling them that they can actually be harmed by words. Um, and in truth, you know, the research indicates that people are really quite resilient, yeah. but you can create a self-fulfilling prophecy if you tell people that, for, um, you know, if you hear the wrong thing, it's going to damage you for life. It's 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 incredibly ir- um, irresponsible. And you can see kind of combinations of, you know, some amount of cynicism and some amount of, of people really feeling offended kind of uh, uh, exist 
existing at the same time uh, on campus. Oh, one phenomenon I want to point out, though, is that prior to 2013, 2014, um, working on campuses, it was always the administrators who were who were generating the problems, who were right. trying to punish uh, faculty, trying to punish students. Um, and again, sometimes it was it was uh, the, the 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 it's genuinely mixed motives. You know, you know that essentially I don't like this student, and by the way, they gave me an opportunity to get this get the student in trouble. In twenty thirteen, more, more twenty fourteen, it was like lightning struck. The change um, among the students coming in was just profound, um, and it, and it was not like I said, it wasn't subtle. And suddenly, you went from students being totally the best uh, protect- protectors of free speech on campus um, for at least all of my career, who got offensive lyrics, who got offensive jokes, who who stood up for their um, other, uh, who who set up free speech walls, suddenly becoming much more activist against. Uh, expression, you know, talking about new speech codes. It was the first time I saw uh, a, a critical mass of students really demanding new speech codes. Of course, that happened in the 80s and the 90s, but I wasn't doing this yet. Um, that you had, uh, you know, people, that's when you're first hearing things like microaggressions and um, right. uh, an increase in, in, in disinvitations and, and all this kind of stuff. That's when the triggering and, in the safe rooms and all the safe spaces came about. So, yep. I mean, so originally it was administrators who sort of a- adopted the this projection of the fragility of the yes. students. But then there was the shift where it was the students who were embracing their own fragility. Yeah. Well, and, and that's something we've really been trying to get to the b- bottom of. I mean, uh, honestly, coddling the American mind, the whole thing is trying to figure out mm-hmm. what was so different about the students hitting campus around 2014. And, you know, as per usual, we came up with a whole bunch of, of, of different things. But we did, in my opinion, probably leave some things out because it was really clear, even when we wrote the original article in 2015, we wrote the book in, in, in 2018. Um, that the students were showing up on campus already believing, um, you know, in the fundamental, yeah. what we call the three great untruths. What doesn't kill you makes you weaker, always trust your <laughs> feelings, and life is a battle between good people and evil people, which we consider like the worst possible advice you could give to anyone, really. Um, and I increasingly think that what happened was a kind of slower process um, in, in some ways that got sped up. And oh, by, by the way, why, why was it all so sudden? The answer a lot of times is social media, because what social media did is it didn't necessarily always create new trends. It just sped up ones that were already existing um, and uh, meant that they all would land, you know, and in this case, uh, th- these were the first generation of, of students who had social media in their pockets since they were little um, is, is a big part of, part of our theory. But I also think that the um, uh, a change in the nature of a- education schools in the 80s and 90s started having long term effect on what kids were taught in K through 12, which was foreseeable. I, I think the other thing is, Charlie, yeah. you foresaw it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, that's right. Although I, m- I must admit, I, I didn't foresee the extent to which all of this would overflow the banks. So yeah. just, we're talking about these the, the shifts. Two things really strike me about the difference between when I was first starting writing about this and now is that a lot of this, you know, used to be confined or most of this used to be confined to university campuses. And of course, there were warnings. What if this seeps out into the rest of society? Well, it has now. Um, These attitudes have now overflowed into corporate America where we have these, you know, various, you know, fragility workshops, et et cetera, um, and and into K-12 education. Uh, which is why, of course, this is a big flashpoint right now. The other thing that really strikes me, um, and I'm looking at your database here, which is really fascinating. Um, people could look at it at thefire.org, these scholars under under fire, that, that when I was first writing about this, m- most of the assaults on free speech were coming from the politically correct left. Mm-hmm. And now, particularly again, this is not this is related to the fact that it's now you know become much more cultural you know you know uh, society wide. Um, you now see uh, many of the attacks coming from the right, so people oh, are yeah. going to be listening to us going, okay, so we're talking about you know free speech on campus at the time when many of the and again this is part of the disorientation um, about free speech because you know up until five minutes ago most I think you know, prominent conservatives would have said we are defenders of academic freedom and free speech. And now they are, many of them are lined up behind literal bans on books and words in one state after another. Critical race theory is something that you and I have been talking about for many, many years is, is profoundly illiberal. 
um, yeah. by redefining what is acceptable discourse so that, you know, critical race theory itself is hostile to free speech. But the reaction to critical race theory is as crude as possible. So in the state of Wisconsin, they come up with lists of words that you can't use, specific images and books that you can't use. So we are right now, Greg, it feels like in this midst of this pincer movement. Yes. From the right and the left, from the illiberal right and the illiberal left. And your your targeting incidents, these the website, what really struck me is you you go through all the incidents, the political motivation of the attacks. And I'm just reading randomly, you know, on, on, from 2019, from the left, from the left, from the right, from the right, from the yeah. left, from the right. It's yeah. just like it's almost now a coin flip. Who yeah. is going to be more aggressive in trying to cancel you or shut you down? And so we are really it feels like in a very perilous moment. Oh, yeah. Where you have the assault. I mean, do you, do you agree with that? I mean, it, oh, yeah, it's, absolutely. Where, where the support for free speech was always a little thin among the woke left. But now, and this is very sort of soul crushing for me, is also to watch how paper thin that support was and perhaps how cynical the support was for free speech among conservatives. Yeah, no. So we've been battling the um, the 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 CRT laws applied to higher ed from the from, from day one, and we're, we've been telling everybody who will listen these are unconstitutional as applies to higher ed. The analysis gets more legally complicated as applied to K through twelve because states actually do have a substantial uh, it, um, authority to to contribute to curriculum, but at the same time they're creating what I call this negative curriculum. So one of the things I've been trying to do, uh, I, I wrote something called the Empowering in the American Mind, trying to give a whole bunch of sort of positive principles like individuality and freedom of conscience and all these kind of things that rather than saying don't 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 don't, how about say like actually we think these the, the why don't we have a positive vision of it instead? But the interesting thing about the targeting of so so the laws are 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 are, are bad and almost always constitution, unconstitutional as applied to higher ed. But the trend of uh, people being you know uh, targeted for canceling on the right. Um, is in at least in no, no small part a product also of social media um, because there aren't frankly all that many conservatives on campus to begin with particularly among professors right. but um, a lot of from uh, from around 2014 once again we started seeing um, professors getting in trouble from the right for what they tweeted um, and then we started seeing professors getting in uh, trouble more often for what they said in class from the right. Um, and that has really accelerated. A lot of the, the examples you'll see on our database are actually ones that come from the right. But there, there are some meaningful distinctions here. Um, if it comes from the left, um, you are somewhat more likely to actually be fired or, or punished. Um, that's partially because the cr critiques from the right usually come from off campus. The critiques right. from the left usually come from on campus. But however, not, not to be outdone, um, if you're if you're being threatened with uh, physical violence, that is more likely to come from the uh, from the right. So you were engaged in a debate over the summer over the question of whether freedom of speech is best upheld by law or by culture. Right. And I think this is a fascinating question because so far the Supreme Court has drawn a pretty solid line around free speech. The courts have been been generally reliable protectors of free speech. But um, you you talk about the danger of the shift in the culture that you're talking about. And when I when I describe the you know the overflowing the banks, I mean we're talking about you know cu cancel culture norms spreading beyond campuses to newsrooms, corporate boardrooms. I mean sooner or later that ends up in the courtrooms, doesn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. And and this is something that I I, I did a debate with um, my friend Ken White um, at Reason Magazine about what's more important, free speech culture or free speech um, law. And my argument is that if I had to choose between the two, it would be free. It would be profound commitment to free speech culture. The best of uh, the best is both worlds, which I think we were, you know, somewhat took um, took for granted that uh, I grew up for, uh, for example, eighties and nineties at a, at a time when the appreciation for free speech culturally was very strong and, and the law was actually good and getting better. And I think that's the ideal circumstance. 
But I think we kid ourselves when we think that, and no, nobody really thinks this, but sometimes you, you do get the impression that people think that law is sort of handed down by heaven as opposed to a product of existing cultural norms. Mm -hmm. You know, free, the, the First Amendment came out of an appreciation for free speech culture, for, for, some, for the norms of, of freedom of speech, of things that used, we used to ex, uh, express in idioms um, you know, that were very common when, when we were kids. Like, of course, it's a free country, everyone's entitled to their opinion, you know, for that matter, walk a mile in a man's shoes, um, all of these, or, or, or also none of your business. You know, these were all things that were much more commonly said when, when we were younger that have largely kind of fallen out of favor and to some degree, troublingly, have been replaced with ideas like speech is violence or can be violence, which is, of course, not uh, rediscovering the norms of the 13th century rather than of the 24th. Okay, this was a point I wanted to get to because this strikes me as one of the most dangerous developments out oh, yeah. there. The belief that that speech is violence. Now, I, again, I, I okay because it, then that means that you would treat it in a completely different way. On the other hand, and I was just making notes about this before you know talking to you today. You know, speech obviously is not violence, but speech can lead to violence. So, how do you draw those distinctions? Well, it's one of these things where when I when I go on campus and I hear this argument that speech is violence, I have to point out that um, this isn't a new idea because people are like, oh, I've just discovered that speech, uh, our commitment to freedom of speech is a social construct. So therefore, um, we can just as easily say that speech is violence. But that also shows a poor knowledge of history because most of human history is speech and violence are considered more or less on a continuum or related, or in some cases, speech insults could, can be, could be considered even worse because it's reputational and would require you, require you ethically, as far as the norms of, 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 of up until recently to challenge someone to a duel or, or get, get, get their heads chopped off. So uh, one thing, and what I'm getting to is the idea that we have this decision, this cultural decision to make a strong distinction between speech and violence. And it only exists as long as we, do, as long as we believe in it, um, just like the whole intersubjective reality thing. Um, but when it comes to most of the things that people want to prevent um, in terms of um, you know, but uh, I know you're saying that speech uh, isn't violence, uh, and I and I say right. almost, you know, by definition. Um, but you know, can speech be violence? If you're talking about you know someone uh, uh, um, threatening, that's not protected speech. So a lot of the things that people point to as being like, well, what about this? I'm like, well, that's not protected speech because that's considered to cross a line and, and starts to look a lot more like action, like threats of physical harm are not protected. Um, harassment, um, sexual harassment and racial harassment is not protected. That's, you know, that's a pattern of behavior that's severe, per, uh, persistent and pervasive uh, uh, that's discriminatory. Um, but it is something that particularly in the current uh, environment it, it is a norm that actually can be met. So a lot of the stuff that people um, are really concerned about, what they don't realize is it's already not protected. And the reason why we're so concerned about this idea that speech is violence um, is that if students start believing it, it can lead to a um, unavoidable cycle of violence. Um, so after the Milo riots in 2017, um, which were much more violent th than I... Tell, 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 tell me what the Milo riots were. So Milo Yiannopoulos was supposed to speak at um, UC Berkeley. Now Milo is the, 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 yeah. um, uh, not, De deplorable. deservedly uh, someone who was not taken very seriously. He, he was a bomb thrower. He he was always trying to provoke. He was always trying to. I mean, I think his tour was literally called the Triggered Tour or something like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, he spoke at Berkeley, and there was a big protest to, to prevent him from speaking. So they actually canceled his speech. Um, and sometimes this gets pointed out as like, yeah, you know, absolutely damn straight. That's, you know, I'm glad we got rid of him. But the people who were actually hurt during the riots were, in many cases, student reporters, people who were just there to see what, what on earth was going on. Um, and, and they say that there was about you know, six hundred thousand, maybe five hundred thousand dollars of damage. But from watching the videos, it actually looks way worse than that. Now, the more disturbing thing, well, the riots themselves were actually quite disturbing. Um, but the uh, was the response of students and watch it. And the 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 university, UC Berkeley, the the, the home of the free speech yeah. movement, had an issue that had all of the defenses of what, why you know reacting violently to. 
Milo was okay. Uh, several of them really insisting that there, that there wasn't just offsite people. They were actually very proudly insisting that there were students there as well. Um, but m- almost all of them going in the vein of his, his speech was violent, so therefore violent response um, it was appropriate. Now, the problem here is that if you believe speech is violence um, and you respond violently, then the other side gets to defend themselves violently. And also, by the way, if you believe that something that really offends you is violence, then there's nothing stopping anyone else from saying that. So the conservatives can now then believe that, that, that speech that offends them is violent. And it just leads to this, this spiral, uh, spiral downward of, of violence, um, which honestly, like if you told me the political situation we, were, we are currently in 10 years ago, I would have said you were catastrophizing. It's, um, you know, it's that, gotten much worse. Yeah. Yeah. And it's gotten so much worse. And so you really have to be defending um, vociferously the idea. It's like, listen, uh, potent argument um, is actually uh, part and parcel of democracy. It's part, part and parcel of, of, um, of, of politics. Uh, and it is cut, does come with this decision that we will now settle what we once settled on the field of battle through argument and discussion. Um, so of course it's going to it's going to sting and it's going to be difficult sometimes. But if you if you go back to the old idea of you know speech needs to be met with violence, that is a downward spiral that we can't afford right now. The other development, of course, is identity politics and the implications for speech. And you know what I'm talking about here, where uh, often it seems less important what is said than who is saying it. And this yeah. is part of the debate over some of the critical race theory, that uh, the the identity of the speaker is, is, is as important or more important than the content of the speech. And you will see this all the time. Um, and on, on social media debates that, that rather than deal with the substance of arguments, it's like, well, you, you know, you should shut up about this because you are a white male or your identity, you know, somehow, uh, discredits your, your argument. So talk to me about that a little bit, because this again, seems to be, to have been really internalized, not just on campus, but in this larger culture as, as well. Yeah. Well, my word for what we've constructed on campus, rather than um, using our best and brightest to figure out solutions to the world's problems, and they, you know there are people there, of course, who's, who, who do that too, but we've also created this thing called what I call the perfect rhetorical fortress. Um, I, for conservatives, I call it the efficient rhetorical fortress, which is essentially conservatives have figured out you know that they can sort of let themselves off the hook from listening to journalists, experts, or any liberals, which is a pretty efficient way to like right. s- s- screen most people you should be listening to out. But the perfect rhetorical fortress is something that could only be produced by um, uh, by academics thinking about this for a very long time, because it's just layer after layer after layer, usually of repurposed ad hominem arguments, that, that ad hominem meaning that it's about the person, not about the argument, um, that allow you to sort of let yourself off the hook. But it's always optional, by the way. You, you never have to dismiss someone, for example, like um, for being a conservative, which I, which I called like the very first level of the perfect rhetorical fortress, because that was certainly around when I was in law school back in 97. Um, but then the next level is identity. And if you like somebody, the fact that they're white is, it, and agrees with you, um, it, it's like, okay, I don't have to dismiss them. Um, but if you dislike somebody and they are actually, say, like a, an African-American male like John McWhorter, you can then say, well, that person is expressing white supremacy, an argument that has made, been made against John McWhorter um, very, you know, very recently. So it's this system of never actually getting to the substance of the argument people are making because we've created all these different ways to never, to never get there. And if you want to not listen to something, which is a very normal human impulse, we now have all these academic reasons to let you off the hook from listening to to them, or for that matter, that you. But you never have to use them if someone you if someone is saying something you like. You know, um, then th- th- you don't have to use it against them. So it's this very. A, this very unproductive way of arguing um, that gets us less than nowhere. Well, and I think we see this all the time is that uh, m- so much of the political rhetoric is no longer designed to persuade anyone. Um, you know, it's because you're you're not actually trying to reason with someone. You're trying to use your arguments as a cudgel to beat the other person or to discredit the other person. And the, the ad hominem argumentation seems to have become, I'm not even sure that, that the vast majority of people understand that, that ad hominem argumentation is a rhetorical flaw, it, that it's a fallacy, <laughs> that you're right. not supposed to do it because it's become so complete. So I'm really interested in getting your take on this new university, uh, the the University of Austin, which was announced with great fanfare, lots of very, very high profile academics, including people you've been closely associated with. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it, it's of course not a university at this point. It's uh, it's kind of a website. But when people are, you know, and, they, and he, but it's it is designed to be a counter to this culture of intolerance. So your your thoughts about it? My my feeling is that even if the only problem that higher ed was currently facing was that it's too expensive and too bureaucratized. Um, that would be reason enough to start doing serious experimentation um, with, with other models. And I think that we need um, experimentation, uh, e- e- even just because things get stale over yeah. time in both K through 12 and higher ed. We need, we need new models. We shouldn't, I mean, K through 12, you know, the argument is that we're still essentially educating kids like we did in the 19th century, um, which is, you know, largely accurate. Um, so I, I, big, I believe in experimentation, but um, one of the things that was kind of amazing was after, um, you know, years of hearing, uh, you know, from people who uh, want to defend, you know, the incredibly wealthy, incredibly powerful and incredibly influential institution of American higher education, but somehow think of themselves as rebels, um, that, you know, like, well, if you don't like it, start your own university. And right. then Pano Canellis and uh, Joe Lonsdale, um, you know, started it it's, uh, and, and several others started, uh, Barry Weiss helped with, with the early stages um, and uh, started their own, you, you know, brand new university with a with an extra clear commitment um, to, to, to freedom of speech and academic freedom. And it got treated like uh, it got treated like with complete derision, um, even by people who I thought would thought, thought would support it. Is it necessarily going to work out well? I have no idea. Am I happy that people are trying this? Absolutely. I think I think there's a long history of people going and forming their own institutions. I mean, the University of Chicago was formed with a specific intention to with a specific kind of uh, of of education. So this is not this is not Johns Hopkins. in the history of. Yeah, exactly. Johns Hopkins would be a perfect example of all of this. So speaking of the University of Chicago, the, the chancellor, Robert Zimmer, um, was on the advisory yeah, um, board um, and you know, which is just um, obviously has no actual response. It's an advisory board, and then he resigned almost immediately, um, saying that the new university. These are his words. Made a number of statements about higher education in general. In general, largely quite critical that diverged very significantly from my own views. Now he didn't he doesn't go into any depth about it, but it, he seems to be saying that that you know some of the comments that were made about how you know higher education is just you know been completely destroyed or you know is no longer interested in the search for truth that this was this was hyperbole or this was unfair so uh, there, there there are there is some rockiness uh, oh sure in, initially initially but you'd expect that as well i think so and and, and to be expected and you know and, and it's people shouldn't confuse the idea of wishing something well <laughs> to the idea that a confidence that will actually work out but i mean you know i've had to deal with and get, getting back to the cost aspect of it um you know schools saying with a straight face that we charge seventy thousand dollars a year um you know all, all things included uh, but that only covers, and this is what you hear all the time, only half the cost of educating a single student. And I'm like, if you're really trying to tell me with a straight face that it costs $140,000 to educate a single student for a single year, well, one, I, I, I think that that sounds kind of nuts. But two, given the fact that it, uh, you know, some of the studies that have been done of impact on critical thinking skills uh, from uh, from higher ed, it's like, well, that doesn't sound like we're getting our money's worth. So we, we need right. to be experimenting in this space. Well, again, don't get me started on on the on the on the cost of higher education or the the way the higher education uh, generally treats undergraduate students or undergraduate teaching. That's a whole different I- issue. But you know, I mean, one of the things that I learned over the years writing about higher education and wondering why there was not more market pushback against the, you know, ignoring of of undergraduate students with a lousy quality of the curriculum or this kind of intellectual intolerance that we've been talking about is because for most Americans, higher education is kind of just the punching the ticket, isn't it? I mean, it's all, it's basically the, the credential and the most for the, for the people who are writing out the checks, the most important thing is checking that box, punching that ticket, getting that credential and all the doors that it opens. And therefore up until very recently, there, there has been a, a, maybe an indifference or a complacency about what's actually going on inside the institution. Yeah, no, no, a- a- absolutely. And one of the things that I think is also going on here um, that I'm glad that Batya Unger Sargon has, has mm-hmm. shined a light on in, in journalism is that uh, one of the reasons why you hear a lot about identity um, on campus, but a lot less about class 
um, is, uh, I think, at least in part, as a pragmatic kind of decision that when the working class kids show up on campus, um, they tend to be uh, they, they tend to be more skeptical of, of what the kids from upper class backgrounds do or, or more skeptical of authority kind of in general and increasingly a decrease and a decreasingly working class kids are showing up at, at some of these elite schools um, and I think that the a lot of what we see is a culture war a, 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 um, a lot of it is actually more much more about economic class. Are there ideas that have no place in higher education? And I'm, I'm asking that with intentionally provocative because, you know, you and I would agree that there should be a wide latitude, but, but at the edges, mm-hmm. is there something that is beyond the pale where even you would say, okay, there's no place for professors who have, you know, who express these views? Sure. Well, I mean, the absolute ideal is that we could remember this idea of uh, scholarly detachment, um, that essentially you should be able to enter a mental space where you can do a counterfactual um, to any scenario uh, you, uh, you're faced with, that you can do, you can play devil's advocate on that, not because th- those um, th- that, that theorizing is right, Um, but because it's productive to making you think deeper about what history looks like, make you think deeper about human psychology. So in a, in a, in a truly healthy academic environment, we'd be able to talk about the, you know, the range of things we could talk about would be much expanded and the process of really interrogating everything from every possible angle would be much more, much more normal. Do I think that, um, you know, like a professor who wants to be a professor of geophysics, who thinks the world is flat, you know, of course, you know, like that, that's going to be inconsistent. Consistent. But I do want to say one thing um, a, a, about that is I, I get these kind of questions an awful lot about someone, you know, who has horrible opinions in their in their daily life um, is that uh, that we've been getting getting away from um, is that there's nothing about having horrible opinions on a topic um, that means you're necessarily a bad teacher. Right. And and the other way around, there's nothing about having all the good beliefs that makes you a good one. In fact, if you're really that doctrinaire, you, you might not even be that creative of a thinker. You may actually be extremely conformist. And and I, and I use conformist intentionally because I do think that I'll, if you look at the whole process of everything from on campus, from the you know the, uh, the who gets accepted to undergrad to the bias related incident programs to the process of of, of applying for jobs to, to to be a professor, which now actually require uh, diversity inclusion statements at, at all the schools yeah. in UC, um, and then even getting to tenure, there's so many different checks on your own conformity that you know I think it's Megan McArdle talks about like the whole the whole process being something um, designed to exclude uh, true true nonconformists. So I, I think that the... And, and so much of it's done under the under the banner of diversity, although ideologically it becomes less and less diverse over time. Yeah, yeah, no, it, 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 absolutely, and and it has. And this is this is one of the one of the amazing things about working with Jonathan Haidt on on coddling, was that I I knew that the there was low viewpoint diversity at some of these schools, but I was still in the model that thinking that it was more like you know three to one um, at most schools, liberal yeah. or conservative. But it's so it's got so much worse, and it really accelerated in the late 90s. And that's one of the reasons why when people start talking about the diversity and inclusion statements that um, a lot of the schools in California are now requiring, which by the way, uh, if I'm understanding some, some of these correctly, the, the, the first step in that is it goes to human resources, not to someone who's academically right. um, you know, inclined. They, they, they let the, the, the same you know, administrators I've been, I've, I've been war- warning about to decide it first before it even makes it into the, the acceptance bio, which is completely nuts. But I've, I've said this, that essentially the idea that someone could have looked at the crop of professors as they currently exist and say, you know what, there's just not enough, uh, there, there's just not enough um, uh, conformity among uh, among this right. cohort. We've got to we've got to clamp down on that. Is distressing. So you, you you talked before about the sort of the cycle of polarization, and um, you know a lot of what we're seeing is not in colleges or universities; it's in general society or, or K twelve education. But yeah. you know, I am I, I am amazed by this explosion of banned books, um, yeah. you know, including attempts to you know ban fences, The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, I don't know when we became so afraid of of books; it seemed like a cliche, you know, you know, banning and burning books. Uh, but but uh, apparently this is not just our imagination. Um, and as you, you might have you know pointed out, Michelle Goldberg has written about this. 
The American Library Association tracks a list of books subject to challenges, and they're up 60% this year. Oh, no. In one year. The challenges to I'm books. Surprised so, it's that low. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I mean, Michelle Goldberg quotes a uh, library official saying, "No, there's always been a steady, uh, you know, hum of censorship, uh, and the reasons have shifted over time. But I've never seen the number of challenges we've seen this year." So, going back to your, you know, reaction, reaction. I wonder where we're going here. That that everybody seems to be putting up more walls, becoming more extreme, saying, you know, we are going to ban your books. I mean, where where does this lead in this, this sort of vortex cycle that you describe? I'm afraid it's going to get worse before it gets better. I've been yeah. saying that since Coddling came out, we, we had yeah. a, a fairly rosy um, end to Coddling the American Mind where we talked about things that could change. And I don't think John and I actually felt that things were going to be fine relatively soon but but I, but I but we wanted to be like not yeah. not so pessimistic. you always, you always we want, want to end your book on a, on a positive note <laughs> and, and also you, you know have people encouraged to actually go out and do things rather than just think all is lost um but i think that things are probably going to keep getting worse for quite some time um john's working on a book called um something about the Tower of Babel. And he thinks that this might be like the one sort of relatively calm year before a completely uh, nuts decade. And I, I hope that's wrong. I, I, I remember, you know, I, I, grew, I was born in 74 and I live in DC and it, I, I was used to, for example, um, the crime rate going up almost every year. Uh, right. And I'd never actually experienced until I was in college it going down. Um, and I was like, wow. And, and then of course that, that trend continued and kind of came, we don't, we still don't entirely know why that happened, why it went down, or for that matter, why it went up so much, um, is also an interesting academic debate. Um, and my hope is that maybe something like that happens in the culture war at some point, um, yeah. that essentially we've all been, all of the existing simmering contempt for each other has all been put on steroids, partially due to social media. And, you know, certainly the election of Trump sent all of those trends into, in, into, in, into free fall or spiraling out or whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, maybe things, uh, I don't even feel like, I, I don't even, even think I could, I can say that with a straight face. I, I think things are going to get worse for quite I, some time. I, I, I completely agree with you. And the, the, the only possible, you know, the, maybe things will get better is, is, pure exhaustion because the <laughs> yes. people just become exhausted by but um or alien I, I, I you know i mean there's you know you you would like to think that uh, you know the as things become more extreme people go whoa okay it's gotten out of hand uh we need to dial it back we need to back off i'm not seeing that at all in fact you know as things become more extreme um all of the incentives are to push it harder and harder and harder um you know because that's that's really where the the incentive structure of of media is these days. Greg, thank you so much. Uh, Greg uh, Lukianoff, who's the president and CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE is an outstanding, uh, irreplaceable organization, a co-author of The Coddling of the American Mind. Uh, you really should check out uh, the the database, um, which is really fascinating, all the different things that people are upset about, outraged about, offended about, and how it breaks down between um, the right and the left. We are facing this pincer movement. Greg, thank, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Charlie. And thank you all for listening to this weekend's Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back on Monday, and we'll do this all over again.